and talk about this topic with all of you. Uh, so the key aspect that uh, I want to talk about today is incubation um, and your role as UX professionals uh, to influence incubation outcomes and uh, the changes that you can make uh, to your design process uh, to increase the chances for success. Um, you know, for me, like incubation uh, has always been a fascinating uh, process. Uh, and, you know, one of the activities I enjoy doing outside of work uh, is gardening. And uh, as an amateur gardener, um, one thing I learned is, you know, the care and attention that goes into sprouting plants from seeds uh, is very different from uh, the care and attention that's required to uh, help the plants grow and thrive. And uh, this difference in the di uh, two stages uh, is, is what I would like to talk about today. And uh, both stages are important and I see a lot of great similarities with new product development. Um, but let's, uh, let's take a look. Uh, you know, when you think about, um, you know, uh, just to kind of like give you some more context, uh, over the last six years at Google, uh, I've ha worked on like several incubation projects. Um, I'm highlighting here a couple where um, I was working on right from inception uh, through successful launches. Uh, there are also a couple of projects where that, that I was a part of uh, that, uh, you know, did not see the li light of the day. Um, and I want to share like these uh, learnings from these experiences around uh, creating products from zero to one. Um, and especially when it comes to, uh, you know, creating products for new set of uh, customers, new set of, uh, uh, you know, problem space or uh, new markets or a combination of all of them, right? And when you think about uh, design process, uh, you're I'm assuming you're all familiar with the typical or the traditional uh, linear waterfall model where, uh, you know, you have a solution in mind, you go ahead and like build it and then launch and then l learn. And we also, uh, I'm assuming, ha know the pitfalls of this approach. Uh, so for the most part, I think uh, people have evolved into a much more leaner, uh, agile and uh, iterative model where uh, you try to figure out uh, a minimum viable product uh, go about like building it uh, and, and then like iterate and uh, launch it and learn from it. And at Google for most projects, uh, the typical process is uh, very iterative and looks something like this. So let's say, you know, building a rocket is the right solution or ideal solution for a given problem. Uh, we might start off uh, by first creating a paper airplane. Uh, test it, learn from it, and uh, at every, uh, you know, stage or uh, every evolution or iteration from there on, you try to increase the value that you're able to uh, offer your end users. Um, and this process, you know, uh, works great when you know building the rocket is the right solution for that problem. Um, however, like when you're exploring a brand new terrain or brand new uh, problem space, uh, this iterative process still has some shortcomings. And, uh, you know, one of the drawbacks of this, you know, build fast approach uh, is that in the haste of trying to do something really quick, you probably uh, are not spending enough time to explore the space uh, and the terrain, um, and probably not even questioning whether you're climbing the right mountain. Um, and, you know, often, like, you might learn uh, that you are on a wrong mountain uh, or on a wrong expedition uh, halfway through the process, uh, or even worse, like, once you finish the climb. Uh, and uh, this ends up, like, resulting in a lot of uh, churn within your team, uh, loss of time and energy. And in many cases, like, you might not even have uh, enough flexibility to uh, take a, a different course or different path um, uh, to, to correct that. Um, and I think like as UX practitioners and leaders of innovation, uh, we all need to help our teams uh, search for and discover the right mountains to climb. Uh, so if there is one aspect that I want to stress on today, that it's that uh, you, our role as UX professionals uh, to help with this. Um, so not just executing or climbing the mountain, uh, but actually exploring the terrain. And, uh, you know, life is too short for building something that nobody wants, right? Uh, 
and there are a lot of uh, you know companies, teams, and startups uh, that uh, make this mistake of not spending time upfront to understand the problem space deeply, uh, and end up building solutions first, uh, and and later uh, struggle with it. So you need to kind of like shift that mindset uh, from a execution uh, first or solution first approach uh, to a problem first and customer first approach. Now you might ask like, how might we uh, figure out like the right products to build? Uh, and uh, I want to talk about you know the the two phases of incubation, right? Um, and I think like in doing upfront visioning uh, work uh, can definitely help uh, with this. Um, and we will dive deep into uh, both aspects of visioning and execution um, in this talk. Visioning a little bit deeper. Uh, now going back to our mountaineering metaphor, uh, as a team, when you are about to start on a, a new expedition, like these are the three questions that uh, I would suggest like uh, you know, your team to ask uh, and solve for. First is, is anyone going to care if you get to the top of the mountain? Um, and let's dive into each of them uh, one by one. Um, so you can answer that question by you know, thinking about uh, focusing on like, what your product will help people uh, do, feel, and achieve uh, once, you, once you put it out there. And uh, you, can, you can answer that by you know, uh, developing deep empathy for your users um, and uh, you know, change your uh, team's mindset around like, uh, moving away from the initial solution or initial issue at hand and uh, thinking about uh, uh, the people outcomes, right? And uh, if you explore other mountains, might you find a higher one? Uh, so this aspect is, when you are exploring a new terrain, like there are a lot of possibilities, right? Uh, which ones do you tackle first? Uh, what's, you know, what will give you the biggest bang for the buck? Um, so the, the, this, uh, this phase is about uh, exploring variety of opportunities and finding the problem solution fit. It's about, you know, without investing into the climb, can you check the top of the mountain? And the idea here is like with the first two phases, uh, you, you have a good understanding or you develop a good understanding of the top problems that uh, your uh, end users uh, or target customers might have. And then like which solutions might address those problems. And the last phase is about packaging it all together and to see uh, how this you know, uh, package um, is, uh, you know, going to appeal to the end users, right? Um, and and uh, it's also important, like, to get this early feedback. And you can do all of this without writing a single line of code. You know, in some cases, you might have to prototype a few things, but uh, I'm, I'm going to show you examples of things that you can do uh, without having to invest too much. Now, uh, we'll dive into each of these three components in, in more depth, and I'll show you uh, some tips and you know, methods uh, that uh, our teams have benefited from. Um, so when it comes to developing deep empathy for users and their needs, uh, you have to think about like, answering these questions. Uh, how, uh, you know, how frequently do users have the issues that you are trying to solve for? Um, how many people does this affect? Uh, how do they solve these needs currently, and so on. And uh, here are a few um, methods that can help you gain empathy and uh, inspiration. Um, now I want to talk about some of these methods in the context of the two projects that I talked about. Uh, so the first example uh, is around, uh, uh, so when we were trying to develop the kitchen assistant for smart displays, uh, we visited a bunch of uh, households uh, and tried to look at uh, the kitchen environments um, and uh, what are the things that uh, people do in the in the kitchens beyond like you know the things that we already know, and uh, some of the you know learnings we had were around uh, you know people have hacks um, uh, to help with the activities that they do in the kitchen. So whether it is uh, you know uh, finding recipes or watching videos while cooking, um, whether it is for entertainment or actually following a recipe video, uh, you know, people have like placeholders for their phones or tablets. Some people even print out uh, their recipes uh, and stick it onto the cupboards. Uh, and in some cases, like, you know, people use uh, refrigerators, for example, um, as, as places to invoke uh, memories. Um, so, you know, they, they put their souvenirs or their family photographs and so on. So as we were thinking about like uh, having an ambient display that's always on, uh, this prompted us to think about 
how can we make uh, this a more uh, joyful experience where it can, you know, um, uh, invoke memories in people's minds and put a smile on their faces when they're walking around. Um, and the second method is, you know, doing, observing people, uh, lab studies, co-design sessions. Uh, again, uh, when it comes to the kitchen assistant, uh, one of the things that we did is uh, co-design sessions with uh, members of the household. Uh, so in a typical household, uh, you know, uh, husband and wife, kids, uh, when we did these co-design exercises, it was clear that, uh, you know, the preferences and the needs of uh, each household member are so different. Um, so the need for like personalization um, and, uh, you know, providing assistance uh, in, a, in a very uh, relevant manner to each of the individuals uh, was, was key. Uh, we also realized like based on time of the day, if it's a morning versus an afternoon versus the evening or weekday versus weekend, the interest would change. So uh, these are all things that really helped us like understand uh, the, the nuances and the context in a more deeper way. The third thing is uh, using surveys. Uh, again, like this is a method uh, that can help you uh, get uh, quantitative uh, data for uh, the, the priorities and the problems that you might want to address. Uh, and, the, and this one is like talking to experts and extremes. So when we were trying to design for kids, uh, we all didn't have um, as much experience working with kids. So what we did is like talk to experts uh, who are well versed in dealing with kids and teaching kids and promoting curiosity and creativity in kids. Um, so the example I'm showing here is uh, a claymation studio um, where uh, the teachers uh, encourage kids to create these uh, clay toys and create animation videos with them. Uh, so talking to them like helped us figure out you need like certain you know structure and uh, building blocks for the kids to actually build on top of them. Um, and then uh, you know existing solution analysis. So this is something that a lot of people do, which is look, look at competitors, uh, but then like going beyond that and looking at uh, you know what are the hacks that people have uh, today, how are they solving today, um, can can certainly help. So here, like you know, as I said, like when you're trying to uh, explore a brand new space, there are like a lot of possibilities that your team can work on. Um, to to give you the context of the kitchen assistant, we identified like. 30 different needs um, that people might have in their kitchen context. Um, and uh, one of the frameworks that we used is uh, problem severity to frequency mapping uh, to, to narrow down to four things that we as a team should solve for. Uh, again, so with a combination of surveys, uh, this sort of like frameworks uh, that make sense, uh, we, we uh, try to narrow it down to like the essence of uh, where we should start with. Uh, again, like in an ecosystem or a, uh, some problem spaces, there could be multiple stakeholders. Um, so in the case of, uh, you know, on-demand deliveries um, in the food space, um, let's say you are a you're a company trying to build solutions for the on-demand delivery companies. Um, you could try to target like end users, you could try to target delivery partners, you could try to target merchants. Um, but like doing this mapping of uh, the needs, the strengths, and the challenges, it can help you narrow down, um, uh, dip, you know, taking into account like your, your company's strengths and abilities uh, narrow down to a, a specific segment uh, of people. Um, so this product playbook framework is also another uh, very rigorous method like to help you narrow down the top priority uh, problems, uh, user problems that you might want to address um, and uh, it taking into account like, you know, uh, how uh, you might be able to differentiate from your customers, uh, from your competitors, um, you know, uh, areas where you can leverage your abilities to the best. Um, so taking all these uh, factors into account to distill to the top things that uh, you as a team might want to focus on. And uh, how many of you here are familiar with design sprints? Okay, it looks like uh, a lot of you are. Um, uh, for new like zero to one product development, which is you know, combining uh, everything that you learned from phase one and two uh, and packaging it all together. Uh, and getting feedback uh, from your customers. 
So uh, Julie uh, Zhao, like she's a VP of design at Facebook, and she talks about this phase as uh, you know uh, defining the people outcomes. Um, so if your product uh, is launched and is widely successful, uh, how does it change people's lives? Uh, how does your product fit into people's lives uh, or the society at large, right? Like so, this is about envisioning and imagining uh, before your product is uh, worked on or built. Um, I'll talk about a few methods that we have used uh, and found helpful. Uh, so for YouTube kids, uh, you know, two or three months into uh, the product development, uh, we created this uh, product pitch deck. Uh, and, uh, and it was essentially a slide deck with a, a set of like benefit statements uh, and a set of features that we walked uh, parents across like US, like we, we talked to 10 or so families within US um, and walk them through the pitch deck. Uh, and by the end of these conversations, it was clear like the, the set of features that we were promising um, and the features uh, resonate uh, with the family. So uh, we could like with more confidence say uh, and pitch, uh, you know, internally as well. Um, and then some teams like, for example, write a hypothetical press release uh, ahead of time, right? Like uh, you know, if you were to, market your product uh, when it's ready, uh, what would your press release say? Um, and this one is like, you know, uh, the hypothetical like app store or play store listing. So if you're building an app, for example, um, what, does, what would it look like? Uh, how would you describe the core features um, uh, to your customers? And you can use this to get feedback, early feedback from you know, uh, potential target customers that, uh, you know, and ask them, hey, if you were to see this, uh, would you download um, uh, this app yourself? Or, uh, and and uh, even more, like you can ask like, how much would you pay for it, um, right? Uh, and then uh, this is, uh, I think like another uh, interesting technique that you can use, which is storytelling. Uh, and something that des as designers, you're like really well equipped uh, to do so. Uh, so for YouTube kids, we developed this like product story video. It was a very cheap and dirty uh, exercise that we did uh, of taking like visuals, um, you know, photoshopping like um, mocks uh, in the images that we have taken of real context um, and created this like, uh, uh, you know, photo slideshow almost uh, and added a narrative on top of it uh, to talk about, uh, you know, uh, if we were to build this product, like how would it uh, fit in like uh, a regular households uh, uh, and family context, right? Um, and what we found surprisingly uh, was this video was circulated within Google, like, you know, uh, probably got like a couple of thousand of uh, views. Uh, and a lot of the conversation until that point was uh, in documents, listing out the pros and cons and uh, spreadsheets and all of that, and, and all of a sudden, you know, the, by creating this uh, almost like a commercial, uh, you shifted the conversation from, uh, you know, uh, the documents uh, to something more human, more relatable, uh, and everybody got uh, what, it, what we are trying to uh, do. So just to recap, uh, these three uh, components of visioning, uh, first is about developing deep empathy for users. Second is exploring possibilities or opportunities and finding the problem solution fit. And then packaging it all together uh, to a compelling offering and getting early feedback uh, from uh, your end users. Uh, now action uh, without vision is uh, only passing time, right? Like Nelson Mandela said this, um, and vision without action is just daydreaming. Uh, when you combine these two, you can uh, really change the world. Um, so I want to talk about the importance of execution, right? Like uh, this is also a, a very hard part, uh, but having spent uh, now uh, in, within execution, there are several learnings, but I, in the interest of time, I'll just stress on two things. Uh, first one is about how do you figure out uh, the ideal MVP? And then second is uh, making your hero features uh, shine. So, you know, once you develop this uh, ideal product vision, uh, the the phase of like figuring out the MVP is always uh, a very contentious and uh, you know uh, discussion among your team. Uh, you'll have a lot of like 
uh, perspectives and uh, heated debates around, oh, this feature should be in, this feature should be out, and so on, right? Um, and one of the things that I've learned is uh, there are two perspectives and uh, uh, frames of mind uh, towards approaching, like figuring out the MVP. Uh, first one is like, you know, a lot of the discussion happens around uh, feasibility. Uh, what can you as a team uh, do taking into account like your uh, expertise and abilities uh, that you already have? Uh, and the second frame or the other end of the spectrum is, is uh, desirability, right? Uh, what's the user need and what will delight the end users and, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, what's desired by the end users? So that's more user-centered uh, perspective. Um, and finding the right MVP is always a, a, along or somewhere along the spectrum. Uh, but uh, by spending time upfront with visioning uh, and having validated uh, your uh, ideal product, ideal experience, uh, you can shift the conversation to be more, um, you know, user-centered, right? You can start off your conversation with, hey, this is where we want to get to. Uh, how can we, you know, work our way backwards rather than, um, hey, this is what's possible or what's feasible today. Uh, what can we do quickly, uh, you know, taking into account where we are. So on, uh, with YouTube Kids as well, like there was a lot of interesting uh, debate and discussion uh, around uh, where we start. Um, and we ended up like finding uh, more towards the ideal experience rather than uh, what's feasible, right? Um, and, and one thing to keep in mind is like a minimum viable product is the smallest solution that uh, creates and delivers a value, uh, a meaningful value to your end users and uh, um, hopefully delights them even. Now talking about the delight aspect, right? Um, so one thing that's important is, you know, figuring out what are the hero features in your uh, product experience, even for an MVP. Uh, uh, what are the hero moments? Uh, it could be interactions that you, uh, you know, th that you, as an end user uh, would experience on a daily basis, uh, or it could be pivotal moments. Um, so in the case of YouTube Kids, uh, one of our goals was we should leave a smile on kids' face every time they open the app. So we invested in things like animations, uh, or you know, when you open the app, a splash screen like uh, animates um, and uh, has sound effects and so on. So something delightful and, and uh, uh, something that uh, puts a smile on kids' faces. Um, and there were also like pivotal moments. So for example, we noticed uh, you know parents have a hard time taking off the devices from their kids. Um, so we introduced this feature called time limits. So as a parent, you can set a timer. And when the timer expires, the device goes to sleep. So this was a really uh, interesting moment uh, and challenging moment uh, that we have uh, tried to make it uh, seamless um, and you know, uh, hopefully avoid uh, the tantrums that, uh, that would happen. Um, and then as I said, like, you know, invest in uh, interactions uh, that the kids might do or like, your end users might do on a daily basis. So we're so we invested in uh, things such as animating the icons, adding sound effects, and so on. And then for us, uh, parents were as important as kids uh, in terms of uh, who we were trying to build for. And uh, so we we invested a lot of time and energy into uh, educating uh, parents around the features, uh, the controls they might have, so that they could uh, curate the experience to their uh, family values and their uh, kids' uh, abilities and needs. So just to recap uh, the two uh, aspects that uh, I talked about. First one is uh, starting with desirability and work your way, way backwards to figure out the MVP. Second is identifying hero features and making them shine. And uh, overall, um, you know, we talked about like visioning and execution. Um, so just to summarize, uh, this is, you know, a process that I found helpful uh, in zero to one development. Again, by no means, uh, this is linear in reality. <laughs> it's very chaotic, uh, but hopefully, you know, uh, the, the methods and the process that I shared with you today, uh, you'll find it helpful um, in your own projects as well. Um, and uh, just to end, like I want to talk about your role uh, as design professionals and UX professionals uh, on incubation projects. Uh, 
I just want to say like, you know, th these projects, uh, even though uh, they might be ambiguous and chaotic, uh, this could be really uh, great learning experiences for you. Uh, and, you know, these projects will challenge you in unique ways. Um, and my hope is uh, I've shared like at least some helpful tips for you to, you know, take and apply them as you uh, embark on these journeys. And I would say like, you know, uh, you should be bold to uh, initiate these uh, because it will, you know, help you, uh, help you get better at solving problems. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, take a leadership stance and uh, go initiate. If you have some ideas, um, uh, go explore them, like find the right team uh, and uh, act on those.